everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm doing another health and fitness Q&A with Bo Bressington. Hey guys. Before we jump into it, I just wanted to explain a little bit about us and what we do if you haven't heard of us before or haven't stumbled across my videos. So, Bo Bressington. Been a personal trainer for eight or so years now. Have studied a lot of other things as well to put under my belt. Um, I have fibromyalgia, and, which is an autoimmune disease, and I've been using that lately to help me with research and help other people that have the same problems. And I'm studying nutritional medicine and psychology, and together we own and operate a gym based in Brisbane in Australia, which is called Eat, Run, Lift. And we also do ebooks and other online things like 12-week uh, challenges, 8-week challenges, and we're also coming up with some new books soon. Okay, so I asked you guys on Instagram to leave me some questions that you wanted us to answer in regards to the health and fitness sort of realm. So I've gone through and we're going to answer them now for you. Yeah, we had a fair few, so sorry if we missed out on you. Okay, so first question, I'll just direct this one straight to you because it's a training sort of question. Yep. Is it better to have, for example, a leg day at the gym? I think she's meaning splits, so leg okay. day, back day, chest day, or just do a little bit of everything. Love you, you're the best. Oh, thanks. She's talking about me or you. Oh, well, I'll take it. So when it comes to training, you want to be able to sufficiently work a certain set of muscles. If we, if we just did one day and we kept on doing the same thing, there's so many muscles in the body, we wouldn't be able to target them or train them the right way that we want to. So what we do is we split up our days. So if we do a leg day and then an upper body day, well, at least we can focus on all the leg muscles and then we can do all the upper body muscles. And then the more time you want to train, the more you can get specific on what muscles you do. So it just means more focus and more recovery, which means more results. Okay. Did you ever find working out boring and how did you overcome that and do it anyway? Also, what forms of exercise do you love the most or find the most fun? You're an inspiration for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. working out, I do find it boring. And sometimes I have so much other stuff to do, like I have to be at home working on something or there is a video that I really want to film because that's my fun part of my day. And sometimes I really just don't want to work out. But I just pick myself up and I have to go. And normally I find that if I walk to the gym, I'm a lot more interested and I've already like warmed up by the time I get there. And just finding some good music to listen to, I find it really helps as well. And I guess setting those little daily goals as well with what you want to achieve really helps. Um, with the one, what form of exercise do I love most? I guess like I've tried so much stuff. I've tried like running and sports and all that sort of thing, but I just like weightlifting because I find it's easy for me, for me to remember and keep track of what I've been doing and then I try and either do more reps or a little bit more weight and it's just about feeding what I've been doing last week, each week. How do I know if I need to do more or less cardio or more or less weight training to lose weight and have a better body? Do I even need to do cardio if I'm training with an intense weight training guide? So I guess the question basically is what's the best exercise for like losing weight and do you have to do cardio? Well. You don't have to. Uh, if you can focus on your eating enough that you're for weight loss specifically, you don't have to do cardio. But I recommend that you do do cardio. Well, I like to call it conditioning uh, instead of cardio because cardio has such a stigma and it's usually about running. But if you can balance your training with weights, uh, high intensity exercise like um, a hit circuit boxing, that kind of stuff, or a group class. And then if you can do some uh, low intensity stuff like jogging, swimming, uh, riding, you're going to cover rowing. all bases. Yeah, even rowing, but that can get pretty intense sometimes. So what happens is when you do cardiovascular stuff, it increases the amount of oxygen that your body can pump throughout your body. And the, and the fitter you are, the better ability you have at actually burning fat. So let me, if you need to know specifically whether you need to do that, if you go for a run and you're and you're puffing, okay, you need to do some cardio. But if you can get through a weight session without feeling too puffed, you have become customized to just lifting weights. So go for a jog, do something that's low intensity and see how you go. And if you feel like you're failing, well, you might need to, you might need to find someone to put it in your training program. Is running and cardio workouts more likely to burn off fat quicker than doing core muscle building like ab circuits, etc.? Love your videos, by the way. Thank you. I definitely think that running and cardio is more likely to burn fat than an ab circuit. Well, What's yeah, your professional opinion? <laughs> oh, it's such a great area because it just depends on how you're doing it and what other training you're doing it with and what eating and diet you are doing. So it can be like 
and this is half the reason why we have the ERL 12 that is so customizable for different people is that you need a balance of everything. If you do an ab circuit, you, well, you're working on your abs, you're working on your core strength and you're building muscle and whenever you, and it just depends on if your desired result is to have a thinner midsection, sometimes it's not always going to be the best result for you. You want to make sure that you have the right balance of your cardio, um, conditioning kind of stuff, which is your, your running and your rowing, cycling, walking, whatever, um, all that low kind of stuff. And then you want to have like your hit workouts, you know, your ab workouts. And then you want to make sure that you do your weights, which is also going to be like your, your mix of like doing heavy weights and medium rep weights. So many things that come into mind when it's about having the best results for your body. And it's all about just finding, um, a good balance really and then it also comes down to the food that you eat and making sure that you're eating the right food for your body as well and that's why with our get lean guide it's like a six month training program so it's pretty full on and they're split up by the body type so it's not just a generic program for everyone it's set on your body type i'll leave a link in the description below and i'll also leave a link to the quiz where you can do the quiz and find out what your most likely body type is. Most people are sort of a mix between two, but at least it'll get you started in the right direction. How do I fit working out of the gym into a busy day schedule? Would it make a difference whether I go early in the day or late at night? I find it depends on you personally. I know a lot of people who absolutely suck at mornings, they're just not morning people, and they do really well exercising at night. I find myself personally, I have to work out in the morning or by the end of the day, I'm just not into it. I don't want to do it. There are so many other things that I find creep up into my day. So I guess it depends on you personally. I'm a morning person, so I find it works out best for me to work out in the morning. And it was the same when I had an office job. I'd go and I'd exercise and then I'd spend all day at work. And then I'd normally do something like walk home from work, which was, that was quite a few kilometers, mm. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. What's the difference between ERL 12 and 8WTC? Okay, so if you haven't been on our website before, we have a couple of training programs. AWTC is an at-home workout program and you can follow it three different ways. You can follow it on your own, on your own with equipment. So what is it? There's a skipping rope, a medicine ball, and a kettlebell. kettlebell. Yeah. Or you can follow it with a friend and it has like joint exercises that you can do with another person. This program, it goes for eight weeks and you don't have to have any gym equipment and it just gives you a rough food guideline as well. It's more for those who are trying to get started with their training. ERL 12 is our online training program. We only run these twice a year. It goes for 12 weeks and it has a pre-challenge week as well. You get your own members log in and you get to log into www.erl12.com. Each week you have your training program provided for you. Do you want to explain how you wrote the training programs, like how you split them up? So pretty much everyone has different goals. So some people might want to lose weight, some people might want to gain strength, or some people might want a little bit of both. Um, and I find with a lot of training programs that you get, they tell you like it specifically most of the time people think that everyone wants to lose weight, which isn't actually a goal for everyone. So I've written it so it's three different exercises and you don't have to stick to the same way the whole time. You can swap and choose as you go and as your goals desire. And you can also choose whether you want to follow it as a beginner, an intermediate or advanced. So it's really customizable for what you want and we don't have a set diet that you have to follow either because that's something that is kind of like a pet peeve of ours is when programs that are online just give you a set diet. We don't really like that because we find that different diets work for different people so we'll give you heaps of recipes and things like that. And then some other cool things is that uh, I know a lot of 12 week programs or any training program, they don't actually write articles on little mm -hmm. things or little questions that you may have. So every week we've got at least two or three different articles that are going to help you get results and understand what you're doing with your body. And these are articles that aren't on our blog or anywhere else online, they are just for the ERL 12 members. And at the end of it all, you get a copy of your whole workout program. So if you want to keep following it, if you've fallen off track somewhere through or something like that, you've got that copy there and that's yours to keep forever. So it starts on the 20th of June. And if you want to get on board and get started ASAP, you can grab your ticket at erl12.com. What's your opinion on calorie counting? Is it as crucial as people make it out to be? I feel like when someone first starts, with eating healthy and trying to get into a training program and you know increase their fitness and all of that sort of thing, counting calories is really useful. Same as counting your macros, but who wants to do that forever? No. No. Um, I feel that counting calories and counting macros is a really good way of seeing how much you should be eating in a day or the ratios of what your food should be made up it's of. It's mainly the ratios that I think are the most important things when it comes to carbs, fats, and proteins. Mm. 
and um, counting your calories and macros is definitely going to help you do that. I would say at the start, it is pretty crucial. You can see where the bulk of your bad food intake is coming from. I think I sounded like a sheep then, but anyway, bad. Bah. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> bah. That's what you got to think whenever you're going to start eating bad food. Now just me being a sheep at you going bah. Oh my god. <laughs> um, but it'll show you what you are eating that's taking up a lot of your like calorie room or using up a lot of your macros. Once you get into the habit and you figure out what works well for your body, you should know roughly your macro and calorie intake. You should be up around where it needs to be or down where it needs to be depending on what you were doing beforehand. But for the rest of your life, I wouldn't be someone who wants to count calories. This one's for Bo. How do you keep motivated to get up and work out through illness? <sighs> <laughs> Do you want to quickly explain, like, quickly explain what fibro is? So fibromyalgia, that's what happens when you try. So fibromyalgia is an autoimmune disease which um, creates a lot of tiredness, fatigue in the body, uh, a lot of pain. So very similar to arthritis and getting like a like a fever or something like that, like you're getting the flu. It also creates brain fog, so some of the things that you do try and say off the top of your head, they don't roll off like they should, so I stutter a bit, I get words and letters mixed up. Um, but one of the main things is fatigue and weight gain. And I know a lot of people have, um, over my journey of having fibromyalgia, have pointed out the weight gain, and sometimes I've had to try and work out what can I do to change this. So. It's all about mindset really, and like I said earlier, trying to work out when you can train and when is the best for you. Um, for me, it's really hard because the time that my cortisol levels peak is when I am training clients, so I have to really try and schedule and plan when I can work out. Um, but if I don't, then I have to try and go for the next best, then I have to go for the next best option and try and find out when um, my body is feeling the best. So try and schedule, when your cortisol levels are up or when you have high uh, energy levels because otherwise it's just going to be not enjoyable at all and it makes you not want to train at all. And just playing devil's advocate, let's say you have a, like three days in a row where you're tired and defeated, what, like, what do you do? I try and eat better, so I really try and focus on what I'm putting in my body so if it comes to weight loss I don't want to be trying to fight an uphill battle the next three days. I've had a few people leaving questions like this and I feel like you'd be able to answer it. Like a lot of people have sciatica. Uh -huh. um, I have had a bad lower back and hip pain over the last few weeks and my doctor thinks it's probably nerve related, something like sciatica. It is likely to take another month or, month or so to get better. Are there any forms of exercise that are good to do with nerve related back and hip pain? There is, but let's just touch on the subject of how to prevent it for anyone else. Um, I've noticed that this sciatica or this sciatic pain Nerve pain has been a thing of like the new generation of the millennials and a lot of it comes from our spine, the way we sleep, the way we study, the way we watch TV. Um, and so if we're hunched over all the time Even and we're like looking down, yeah, so our whole uh, posterior kinetic chain is going to start switching on and loading up. And I find that when, so for those of you who don't know where the sciatic nerve is, it kind of runs from the base of your spine and it can go all the way into the toes down the side of your leg. A lot of people get mis misguided advice to, they hear the word sciatic and they think they actually have sciatica but what they might have is a sciatic nerve impingement which comes from having tight glutes, um, a tight lower back and ITB. So what you want to really do is focus on stretching out these three areas, um, doing things like uh, deadlifts can actually really improve it, but only once the pain has gone away. You want to make sure it's a preventative thing or it's a rehab thing. You don't want to do it whilst you've actually got the pain. Stretching, foam rolling, trigger pointing are the best ones. But for those who do have that psoriatic pain, um, have a look at getting dry needling, which I found was one of the best things that worked for me. Yep, I had it as well. It's physiotherapists who do that usually. Isn't yeah, and massage therapists, acupuncturists. Also, another thing is sleeping. Make sure you are sleeping on your back. And I know a lot of you might find it really hard to sleep on your back, but just really, you pretty much have to train yourself to do it. Um, otherwise, you're going to get a lot of lower back problems anyway.
how to deal with soreness and recovery. A while ago we did a blog post on this, so I'll link the blog post in the description as well. I find for me personally, when it comes, I don't get like super sore after exercising anymore unless I haven't done something for quite a while. Uh, it'll take your body a little bit of time to get used to it, especially if you are just jumping back into training for the first time or actually starting to train for the first time. So I find for me personally, after I work out, it really, really helps me if I stretch and then I foam roll and I normally try to avoid it, but Bo makes me use the trigger point ball and trigger point. If it's really bad, a good thing to do is have some Epsom salts handy and you can go for a bath with the Epsom salts. It will help your muscles relax. If you don't have any Epsom salts or you don't have a bath, just have hot water over you. So a hot shower will really help with the muscles to relax. And then also, to look after yourself properly, you do need to make sure that you are following up and you're not just doing the stretching and the exercising, but also making sure that you're every now and again seeing a physiotherapist or a chiropractor, a massage therapist, something like that. There might not be anything that is super painful on you, but just make sure you're getting checked up regularly just so that nothing is going astray. Yes. All right, so hopefully that video wasn't too lengthy, but I'm gonna to have to wrap it up here. That's all we really have time to put into this one. I hope you guys are doing really well and I will catch you in my next video. Bye. See ya.